In the last video, we listened to a number one crossbar intra-office call using reverted pulse signaling. This was the signaling method carried over from the panel and used when the crossbar was first introduced. But in later years of its life, the number one also learned to do some new tricks. The one we'll talk about today is MF, or multi-frequency signaling. MF signaling is not unique to the number one crossbar. It was introduced throughout the Bell system in the 1940s, initially as a way for operators to complete long-distance calls to other dial exchanges without having to verbally pass information to other operators along the way. Seeing the benefit of this method, the Bell system began to use it as a way for both local and long-distance switches to signal each other in the 1950s and 60s. These intricate switches are one of the types actually used to connect long-distance calls. This key set in the test equipment is just like the ones the operators use. It is hooked up to a loudspeaker so we can hear what goes on behind the scenes. Each key has a combination of tones or notes of its own. When the operator plugs into a trunk, she is connected to a sender, such as this. By pressing her keys, she puts the tones into the sender. The sender registers the tones and remembers them. Then it calls on another device, the marker. Telephone people call it the brain because of its complex nerve system. The, the transition to MF signaling was desirable for a few reasons. First, MF was much faster than any signaling method in use at the time, pulsing at up to seven digits per second, compared to about one to two per second for revertive pulse and about one per second for dial pulse. This increase in signaling speed was a huge benefit for central office equipment, where holding time was an important factor in keeping equipment cost and size down. Each telephone call in the dialing stage takes one originating sender and one term sender for a number of seconds, depending on how fast the caller dials and how fast the senders signal to each other. Telephone switches were engineered to contain only enough senders to handle the number of calls expected to be in the dialing stage on a high-volume day, like Mother's Day. Since MF signaling was faster, the senders were not tied up for as long on each call, and they could each process more calls per day. And since each sender costs thousands of dollars, and a single office usually contained hundreds of them, needing fewer was super helpful for keeping costs down. Secondly, MF equipment was designed to transmit anywhere from 3 to 10 digits forward, which made it great for use in the long-distance network, where the number of digits that the next central office needed could be variable, depending on the type of equipment in that office. For example, on Mr. Miller's call to Chicago, the first three tones are the code for Chicago, the next three, the code for the office name, and the last four tones, the telephone number. And finally, MF had been designed from the start to work well on toll circuits, since its AC waveform was in the voice frequency band, and it could be transmitted easily over existing toll equipment, including through condensers and repeaters, which were used just about everywhere in the long-distance network. This is in contrast to previous forms of signaling, which were all DC-based, and worked best with simple and short local loops. In order to show how MF encoding works, I spent a very long time creating this graphic. Then I realized that it did a really bad job of explaining things, so I stole this graphic from Wikipedia instead. Each MF digit consists of two and only two audible tones. Each tone has its own numerical value. Zero is 700 hertz, one is 900, two is 1100, four is 1300, and 7 is 1500. The value 10 is represented by 1700 hertz and is used for special informational signals only, not to transmit digits. A digit is signaled by combining two tones in a particular fashion, known as 2 out of 6 encoding. Because only specific pairs of tones are allowed in the 2 out of 6 system, other combinations can be easily rejected. To signal the digit 1, we use the tones for 0 and 1. To signal a 2, 
we use 0 and 2. And to signal a 3, we use 1 and 2. This pattern continues all the way until we reach 0. Because there is no other way to signal a 0 using two of the available numerical values, we instead send a 0 by transmitting a 4 and a 7. In addition to the tone combinations used for sending numbers, we also have a few others. Most often used are the tones for key pulse and start, sometimes referred to as KP and ST. The KP tone is transmitted in advance of any digits and prepares the central office equipment to receive digits. Any digits sent before the KP signal will be ignored by the receiving equipment. The ST signal is sent last and indicates that the originating side is done transmitting and informs the equipment receiving the MF to proceed with its portion of call setup. The MF tones in the number one crossbar are generated by these oscillator tubes, and there is one tube per tone. As with everything in a central office, there are two sets of tubes for redundancy. If one tube goes bad, the oscillator will fail over to its standby unit. As you can see, these tube circuits make their tone continuously, and the tones to be transmitted are simply cut in by relays in the sender circuit as needed. Speaking of senders, the one we're going to use for this call is a new style sender. These were first introduced in 1966 and provided a number of features that weren't available in the old style senders like the one we used in the last call. Our number one crossbar got these new senders installed in 1973. is no longer in service. Please hang up and check your directory. Wait, that pulsing was awful quiet, wasn't it? Well, yeah, it was. On a normal number one crossbar MF call, you wouldn't hear the pulsing very well. Look, okay, I know you want to hear it, so let's do this again, and this time I'll wire it up special so that you can. Just be aware that if you were actually placing this call, you wouldn't actually hear the tones. The first thing you might notice is that on these new senders, the dial tones cut out as soon as the first digit starts pulsing. That's a surefire way to determine whether you're hearing a new style sender or an old style sender in a number one crossbar. Okay, now that we have the first three digits, the originating marker has got to do its thing and set up the connection through the district and office link. On MF calls, the signaling only starts once all the digits have been dialed. There's none of that overlap that you hear on revertive pulse calls. I guess they figured out that the holding time for a terminating sender would be so short with MF that it would just be better to wait until the slowpoke subscriber had finished dialing completely and then just outpulse all at once. The term sender receives the MF using this MF receiver circuit. The receiver circuit consists of a bias control, a volume limiter, the KP gate, and three discriminators that split the tones out to operate their associated relays. Additionally, there is error checking circuitry that is designed to catch and reject invalid tone pairs. If an error is detected, the terminating sender will signal a polarity reversal back to the originating sender, which indicates a call setup failure. As each tone pair is sent, the relays operate here at the receiver. Inside the sender, other relays store each digit for eventual transmission to the marker. What we're hearing here is KP2562. Three, start. The KP is known as the key pulse 
and that's what tells the MF receiver to start listening. This is so that if any stray tones or noises appear on the trunk, they won't mistakenly be registered as valid digits before the signaling actually begins. Following the key pulse, we have five digits starting with two. Now, two in this case is the last digit of the office code we dialed. We send a two before the line number because a number one crossbar can actually host more than 10,000 lines in its terminating end if we ask it real nice. The two tells the switch that we want to terminate this call in the 832 group of 10,000 lines and not the 833, 835, or 83 anything else group. Following the two, we just send forward the customer's line number and then the start pulse. Once the term sender receives and decodes the KP plus 5 MF digits, it calls in a terminating marker to close the connections through the incoming link and line link as necessary. Except that for this call, the number we dialed was found by the terminating marker to be out of service and was instead routed to intercept. The number you have reached is no longer in service. Please hang up and check your directory. That's our oldest volunteer, Les, that you hear on the recording. We can also play around with MF using this telephone company test set, which is basically just a blue box. If I plug directly into the receiver circuit and start pulsing at it, nothing will be registered because the receiver circuit needs a KP to open its gate and allow the tones to reach the discriminator portion of the circuit. Once we KP at it, any digits I pulse now will operate their respective relays. Remember that for any digit, two and only two relays will operate. There's a checking circuit here that notices if an incorrect combination of relays operated and informs the sender to immediately send this call to reorder. This particular test set is one of many that were used to test outgoing and incoming trunks in central offices, and it's rather new by crossbar standards. The original test set that came with the office in 1942 is on wheels, and is called a tea cart, because it resembles the kind of trolley that you might have your tea served from. The tea cart version can transmit RP or MF, and plugs into the MF tone supply here. And yes, crossbar offices had hot and cold tone and battery taps just about everywhere. Once the test set's wired up, I could do the same thing as with the newer set. MF signaling was most famously exploited by freakers in the 1970s to manipulate the long-distance network. A discussion on freaking and examples of how it was done will come in a future video, but if you want more details, I suggest listening to Evan Doorbell's recordings or reading Exploding the Phone by Phil Lapsley. Both present a fascinating history on the topic. Anyway, thanks for watching! The next video will be the last in the number one crossbar series, and we'll talk about route advance and second trials, which are really cool things that markers can do. See ya!